Yo, this episode of Cheat Codes, a sickle cell podcast, was made possible by Global Blood Therapeutics and is intended for educational and informational purposes only. Visit GBT.com to learn more. What's up, Warriors? It's Dr. Z. And Dr. C. Here with another episode of Cheat Codes, a sickle cell podcast. Man, this is going to be a dope one. I'm so excited about this one. We have a wonderful guest. I've been stalking this guy, I feel like, to try to try to become a friend of his. And uh, it finally paid off. <laughs> I Literally, I would go to Ash meetings looking for this guy, and he's hard to miss because he's built like a football player. And I'd see him, and I'd be like, Dr. Wally Smith, can I just talk to you for a minute? And, uh, you know, it took three ashes, but uh, next thing you know, we were having drinks together. Yep, and uh, he came to visit us in Detroit, gave a wonderful talk. Uh, a few years ago and and it's always great to catch up with Wally at meetings just incredibly bright guy he's uh the Florence Neil Cooper Smith professor of sickle cell disease in uh Virginia Commonwealth University he's on the Institute of Medicine's committee on standards and trustworthy guidelines he's off authored over a hundred publications had 50 grants and really is you know one of the world leaders in sickle cell and really in important things. And uh, on top of that, great doctor, great guy, fun to be around, great storyteller. Redefine the way we think about pain. Just a tremendous, tremendous guy. Well, I'm really excited. And this episode is going to be just a little bit different because we're just going to talk to Dr. Smith for the whole episode. Yeah, I think with the legend on it, we didn't want to gild the lily with the word of the day or article. Or... Yeah, so we'll make it a little easy on us and make Wally do the work. For sure. All right, y'all, let's get to it. Dr. C, man, I'm really excited. We, we, we got him. I am so excited. I think this is going to be the best episode yet. I can't believe we got him. That's, that's where I'm at right now. I just can't believe we got him. We have a special guest for you today, Warriors. I mean, this guy is, th- this is Dr. Sickle Cell, this guy. He is everything that uh, makes me proud to be part of the Sickle Cell Provider community and, and really doesn't require an introduction because everybody knows Dr. Wally Smith. Dr. Smith, welcome, welcome, welcome. Yo! How are you, man? I'm good, man. What, what What's new and exciting? How are, how well, are people working? Well, I have to tell you, you know, if I if I am the sickle, sickle giant, the real giant is my now deceased 101-year-old dad who was uh, a giant in a little town in Alabama. And at his funeral, they were lauding him. He, uh, he was a giant among men. And um, I have to say that it, Almost everybody says, I see your father in you. And so, you know, what better uh, compliment can I, can I have than that? Amazing. I'm proud, you know? I'm just As proud. you should be. As you should yeah, be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell, uh, us, tell us a little bit about... Well, about he was born dad, in 1919. Right? So this start right there. Flu epidemic, right? Wow, wow. 1919. In Alabama? In Alabama. So he got to serve in World War II. He got to work in segregated schools. He became a principal of a newly integrated school after the white principal finally retired. And, you know, a third of the school left in protest because you can't have a black man in charge of white students. You know, now they have a street named after him. <laughs> <laughs> So he earned it. That's an amazing arc. That's an amazing arc. That's how you do it. I love that. So I'm a, I'm a little bit, little, you know, kind of proud. <laughs> I'm, I'm not at all surprised that's where you came from, Wally. I mean, they say we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors, right? That's amazing, man. Big condolences for your loss, for your family's loss, man. But it sounds like your dad lived um, a larger life than most people do. Absolutely. They accomplished a lot. Got to see his grandchildren. He did. Well, hopefully you guys find a little bit of peace in that, man. Definitely. Awesome. So so, so this amazing man who contributed so much then has, has a son named Wally R. Smith. Tell us, tell us a little bit about that, man. What, what, where was Wally R. Smith born? I'm his only son. Yeah, my brother is my half-brother. My mom had two kids, but only one with this man. I was supposed to have been the third. <laughs> <laughs> he was the junior. I was supposed to have been Wallace Smith 
the third. But yeah, small town Alabama. Or what can I say? In the fifties. Dothan, Dothan, right? Dothan, Dothan, Alabama. Yeah, what's in Dothan? <laughs> I mean, Wally, Wally R. Smith. Yeah, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> yeah, they call it the peanut capital of the world. It was relatively docile. Uh, you're 100 miles southeast of Alabama, of uh, Montgomery, Alabama, where all the Martin Luther King stuff was happening. You're 150 miles southeast of Selma, Alabama, where Pettus Bridge is and Martin Luther King there, Ku Klux Klan there and you're 80 miles north of the gulf of mexico so we would go to the beach and the climate there was slightly different they called it the redneck riviera it was (laughs) (laughs) wow (laughs) yeah but it was segregated beaches you know growing up but i had a good sort of uh beaver cleaver life growing up my, my, my family protected me. It was in the 60s, and my family protected me from as much as they could. And then integration came. Who saw that coming? So school integration upended my parents' life because they were teachers. That was the principal. Upended my life. Now I'm having to mix with white people for the first time. And how, how old are you at that time? All right, so I'll tell you a story. In the eighth grade, I got a scholarship to go to band camp because I played the saxophone. And the next year was when school integration came. So I would have been, what, 11? Something like that. Fell in love with a little white girl named Kathy Thurston. Wow. She had glasses, played the clarinet. It was puppy love. Met a whole bunch of Miami Jews. Didn't know what that was. They were listening to Chicago, 10CC Drive. Blood, Sweat, and Tears. I didn't know who those bands were. They probably were smoking reefer. I didn't know it. I mean, it was, it was really coming of age in a very unusual circumstance. And it was in Tallahassee, Florida, that all this happened. And FSU, you know, had this summer band camp. Well, I came back. My accent had changed. Everybody said, what's wrong with you? You don't talk Southern anymore. I was talking Miami. <laughs> <laughs> so I became bicultural, you know? Starting then, I became bicultural. So do you still play the saxophone? Because I'm thinking we could get a band together. Patrick Hines plays a French horn. I I can join. We could do some things. It would work. I'm better on keyboards. So 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 you get over your puppy love. You're you're now you're now bicultural and you get into high school. And not popular with blacks. Not popular. Oh no. I'm a traitor. Wow. I'm not black. I had to turn my card in. Whoa. I lost the student council election because I wasn't black enough. Seriously? This hippie named Alan Jones stood up and gave a speech, and there were blacks who were on one side of the auditorium, and the whites were on the other side. He said, I believe in black power, and all the blacks got up, you know, stood up and jumped up and down. He was raising his fist, and he was like, oh. And then he said, and I believe in white power. And all the white kids stood up, and they raised their fists, and my heart sank. Oh. He got 500 votes, and I got 200. Well, I'm glad, because you could be a politician now, and that wouldn't be very useful. But It uh, wouldn't be useful. Maybe steered you into medicine. So. You talk about learning about politics. Whoa, did that teach me? Wow. I, now I got to ask, man. So, so as you're going through high school, when does the bug hit you? When, when do you realize? And I think the science thing is for me. I would say that that hit me before high school. I would say that that happened in the seventh grade. My math teacher was Mr. Reese, a serious black man. He stroked his beard, literally stroked his beard and thought about math. I had never seen that in my whole life. And I was like, wow, he's a true thinker. And I said, I want to be like that. So I got into science and I started doing these science projects when I started collecting insects and bugs. And I went and, you know, learned the periodic table. And then one of the guys who was a a year older than me had this science project and he went to the state finals with it. And I saw him. His name was Michael Jackson. I got to be like Mike. I got to be like Mike. (laughs) (laughs) You were trying to be like the wrong Mike. (laughs) <laughs> so I had, to, I had to put my science project together. It was on Mayan mathematics, base 20. 
what the heck are Mayan mathematics, man? Base 20. They, had, they had 19 symbols. And then the next, the, uh, so that you had your ones and then you had your 20s. And then you had your 400s. Wow. <laughs> you blew my mind, man. <laughs> so that was, that was great. And by the time I got to high school, it was, it was all set. That childhood fantasy of wanting to be a doctor, highway patrolman, and all that sort of thing mingled with this science thing. And also with my parents who said, boy, you're going to go to Morehouse and you're going to be a doctor. And I sort of was a goody two-shoes kid. And I said, yes, ma'am, I'm going to go to Morehouse and I'm going to be a doctor. <laughs> wow. So... Man, I just have, I have, there's so much to unpack in that, man. I have, I have so much to ask. Well, the problem was that I didn't go to Morehouse because integration, once again, upset my whole mindset, right? It's no longer just Morehouse that I can aspire to. I can aspire to the whole world. And so in comes this box of applications to West Point and to new college and to schools I'd never heard of. And at the bottom of the box was this Harvard application. And my brother, who was working for the Defense Department, comes home at Christmas and says, oh, no, you're going to Harvard. He says, I work in the Defense Department in the Pentagon. And I'm telling you, everybody who's anybody is, uh, you know, a Harvard man. You're going to go. Now, he didn't just say that. He flew me up there and went with me to the interview. Okay. So he and my mom schemed together to make sure that I went and looked at Harvard. And I think I was the only person from my hometown to go to Harvard that year. And I don't think there had been anybody five years prior. And, and so then you wound up in biochemistry there. I did. Was that crazy or what? <laughs> but I was stupid enough to think that I could do that stuff. I mean, I think you're being a little hard on yourself here, my friend. <laughs> I had Watson of Watson and Crick as a lecturer. No. Yeah, I did. What? <laughs> he says some crazy things sometimes. Did you get any of that in class? Uh, he has micrographia. He's not a good teacher. <laughs> wow. That is pretty cool, man. I've known, I feel like I've known you for like five years and that has never come up before. Crazy. Okay. So now we're, this is what the seventies now. Yeah. I'm discovering my blackness. You're yeah. Oh, wow. At Harvard. At Harvard. At Harvard. How is that going? It, w- it went great. How many black students are at Harvard in the seventies? A bunch. Really? And they're like me. Wow. What do you mean? Like me in a new country. This is a new country. This is not America. Are, are these your buddies for the rest of your life? Yes. Yeah. It's like a formative experience. You're all oh, there it's together. Like a fraternity. And... There were no fraternities at Harvard. But there might as well have been for blacks who came from the South or the Midwest the dinner club? Or, or Cleveland. Yeah. So th- those people uh, helped form me and vice versa. We did have a band, Mike. We had a band. I was the leader. It- is there any video footage of this? Uh, there's audio. Oh, we got to get that. Yeah, we were doing Parliament, Parliament Funkadelic and all that stuff. Oh, Disco, nice. yeah. Wow, so you're, you're, you're at Harvard post-segregation discovering the black side of Wally Smith. Yes. Wow. I read history. I learned the history of science. I learned... United States history from another perspective. I discovered jazz. I discovered all oh, the, the beat poets, Gil Scott Heron, all this stuff. It was just all new to me. Did sickle cell come into the picture then? I can imagine if you're studying biochemistry. No, and- no the only reason it came into the picture was my um, Elizabeth Simons, who was a BU medical school professor, was my counselor or, or um, sort of science mentor that they assigned me, she was the one that told me about sickle cell disease. And she told me in the context of understanding DNA, RNA, and proteins. And so I learned about DNA, RNA, and proteins and how sickle cell disease 
was a you know, result of a, you know, you know the whole story, one little base pair change, one little amino acid change. That's where I first got that. And I didn't know anything about sickle cell before then. Amazing that I went through school, all of high school, never heard about sickle cell disease. Wow. Yeah, that is. I mean, that's something. That really is something. And this is kind of, is this around the time of uh, the National Sickle Cell Act kind of? Yes. The National Sickle Cell Act had no impact on me. None. Zero. Not even newsworthy. Not newsworthy. Wow. So now you're at Harvard, you're discovering yourself, and then you, you do your residency, right? Yeah. Where was residency, Dr. Smith? Or med school. Med school, you went back home? Oh, yeah. We skipped med school completely. I had to go to medical school. I was all teed up to go to Duke. The, the, the prestigious thing to do, right? You go to a prestigious college, you got to go to a prestigious medical school. But it was expensive. And while I had my heart set on going, I was feeling pressure. I was feeling like I'm going down kind of a trap door. This could be bad. Because it was high pressure. You went to one year of basic science, and then your second year, you started on the wards. Then your third year, you went back, you did a year of research. And your fourth year, you went, I was like, I don't know, I don't know. Well, it turns out my dad was a disabled veteran, and it turns out I could get a free ride to the University of Alabama, and that's what I ended up doing, and boy, was that the right decision. Got back to the University of Alabama in Birmingham, and not only was it cheap, it was high quality, and I didn't know that until I got there. It's a great school. Yeah, it's a great school. I didn't know that. And at this point, so Birmingham, Alabama, very different from Dothan. Oh, yeah, very different. More racist, by the way. Say that again? More racist. Really? Yes. What? Yes. Wow. I was not expecting you to say that. That is absolutely true. Wow. There's more to lose. There is more money at stake, more property at stake, more economic power at stake. Dothan is just a whole bunch of farmers. There's not a whole lot of difference between the black middle class and the white middle class. That is so interesting. Wow. Okay. So you go, you, you, you work your way through, through medical school and, and a premier medical school at that. And then internship also at university of Alabama. Yeah. And then residency, you go to Memphis. I go to Memphis. Yeah. How was Memphis? Then? That was a breath of fresh air because that vibe was a lot looser than the Birmingham vibe. I escaped all that feeling of racism. I escaped all of that stuff I was carrying while I was in medical school. What, why Memphis? What brought you up there? It was a program that we called it a work program. Have you heard that before? <laughs> the, word, the idea of a work program is you draw your own blood, you do your, <laughs> you wheel a patient to the x-ray, but everybody gets through and they all help each other. So that was the the vibe of the training program. UAB was busy with his head up as you know what. <laughs> so Memphis just seemed like a good place to train. It was a, so, oh, so I learned, I learned, all that pressure was off. So I learned more. People accepted me and I learned more. And um, I'm really glad I did, uh, went there. So when did sickle cell stick? Well, it started sticking in Memphis. Now, why did it start sticking there? Well, I mean, Memphis has a huge go. sickle cell. The legacy. That's a huge legacy. Yeah, absolutely. So let's tell everybody the legacy of Lemuel W. Diggs. Does anybody know who Lemuel W. Diggs was? Yes. He described the pathology of sickle cell disease, period. He described it. Every organ, gross anatomy, the whole histology, everything. Lemuel W. Diggs. Now, now wait. I mean, did you? So you certainly crossed paths with him. I did. Okay, tell us about that. He, he must have been really old by then. Really old. <laughs> he was a pathologist. Pathologist, charitable, but unable to teach, unable to really mentor me. Just too old. And uh, so Alfred Krauss, his mentee, ended up mentoring myself and a couple of other. Uh, folks, including Loretta Bobo, 
who was the person who really is responsible for me being in sickle cell. And Loretta, like me, was a general internist. We finished our residencies and we were doing, essentially the, doing the job of a hospitalist. Before the word was coined, we were hospitalists. And we were working in the charity hospital called the Regional Medical Center at Memphis. But there's where we inherited the sickle cell clinic, Loretta and I, from Alfred Krauss, the mentee of Lemuel W. Diggs. Because nobody in hematology, oncology wanted those patients. Nobody wanted them. And they were just orphans needing a, needing a home to go to. And we gave them a home. And that, that must have been hundreds of patients. Yeah. We were, we were renegades. We were renegades with the Division of General Internal Medicine. I mean, look, we're nigger lovers, right? We're out here just taking care of these black people. Uh, but it's okay because you're black too. So, of course, you do that. Despite the fact that Lemuel Diggs. Yeah. Talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> was not. Yeah, he was not. <laughs> he was a steam, an esteemed pathologist. Oh, my. Yes, that's different. Wow. He wrote books. He made, he made academic heyday on, on those bodies. <laughs> so, yeah, so we took that clinic and we humanized it. Opiates immediately became an issue because patients were saying, I'm undertreated. What else is new? And you guys are giving me enough medication, and we're going, we're going to try to do the right thing. And nobody knew what the right thing to do was, just like we don't now. What's the right thing to do? Well, more. More is the right thing to do. But we took that clinic over, and it grew. People started coming. That is the Regional Medical Center at Memphis Legacy right there. I like that you said that we humanized that clinic. That, that, that is something that a lot of people are missing. Oh, we talked about it today at the Sickle Cell Disease Coalition meeting, that this disease is a disparities disease. In fact, you know that NASM report just came out that said, hey, sickle cell disease is a disparities disease, and you should say so, and you should, it should get all the benefits that all the other disparity issues get. All those should be applied to sickle cell disease, federal dollars and, and set-asides, all that stuff, because sickle cell disease is that neglected. That's a really nice report, that uh, National Academy of Sciences report. They did a good job. They did a great job. All right, so we digress. So, so you know, the road from Memphis to Richmond. Yeah, that was interesting because I thought I was going to leave sickle cell behind in Memphis. I honestly did. Were you just burned out? No, I was sure that Richmond had it together, right? I was sure that because there was a hematologist in Richmond who identified with sickle cell disease, a guy you know. Yeah, Dr. Paul Swerdlow. Paul Swerdlow. But, but he, had a, he, he, he had a surprise for you when you got He there. had a surprise for me. <laughs> he, he said, I'm lonely. I'm stigmatized. I understand you know about sickle cell disease. Can you help me write this grant? Can you help me see patients? So I ended up not leaving sickle cell behind after all. Thank goodness for that. Yeah, seriously, thank goodness for that. And then something wonderful happens through Paul Swerdelow where he leaves you with an incredible amount of data. He does. How did that influence, how did that influence what happened with the rest of your career? Well, I got recruited to become a health services researcher. And for those who are listening, cost, quality, and access, that's what health services research is is about. You're trying to study how to improve delivery systems, how to influence uh, the quality of care, satisfaction with care, and to make utilization more effective and lower costs, if at all possible. That's what health services researchers do. And I fashioned myself as, I'm going to go do health services research at then was called Medical College of Virginia. And I didn't say health services research in sickle cell disease. I just said health services research. But when I got here, Paul Swerdlow said, we need help in the sickle cell clinic. And my health services research boss, mentor, guy by the name of Bob Centaur, who is another reason I stayed in sickle cell, said, you know, you're one of maybe two health services researchers in sickle cell disease in the country. 
you can make a name for yourself in sickle cell. Don't look down on it. And I'll reveal that I had an inferiority complex. I'll reveal that I did feel stigmatized and that nobody liked me. I was tired of not being liked after all. High school, they didn't like me. <laughs> we love you, Wally. <laughs> so I wanted to do something that was popular. And I didn't think sickle cell was that popular. But my boss said, no, no, you are the only one in this field. You can make a name for yourself in this field if you hang with it. So I carved out a career in health services research for myself. I, I feel like carved out is not really, I mean, you cemented it in sickle cell disease. It is like, I mean, your, your CV, and granted, the, the most recent CV I have of yours is from November 2017. Uh, so this is missing three years of what you've accomplished, but it is impressive. I mean, you have done so much for this this population. I, for one, am sure glad that you didn't go to the dark side, man. You know, it's been a bit of a calling because what has happened is I've recognized a lot of that Alabama zeal doing something for people who are less than, and a lot of my dad's values. It's one of the favorite songs was, if I can help somebody as I pass along, then my living will not be in vain. Mm. Dang, man. You talk about living that one out. That's what I've been doing. <laughs> so it was like, okay, I'm going to help somebody as I pass along. That's deep, man. I mean, Dothan, Alabama is like 100 miles away from Tuskegee, Macon County. Oh, yeah. My dad went to Tuskegee. For Stop. Oh, he did for school. Yeah, he wow. did. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That is just unreal. Wow. Yeah, so I was bringing all of that into the sickle cell community. And so health services research is about how to get the health system to provide appropriate care or how to allocate resources. Or Yes. Um, so, you know, that's... Yes. right in the wheelhouse of what sickle cell needs, right? We it is right in the book. And my care. mentor recognized that. Bob Centaur recognized that and said, you should stay in health services research, but in sickle cell disease. And, and I see so many ways you've made a big impact over the last 30 years doing that, whether it's the, uh, like things around the community health workers um, and, and really trying to find a way to deliver care to a large population with chronic disease or that transition of care and building a viable adult program or, um, you know, re really figuring out if we're delivering on what we're supposed to by measuring quality of life or, or you know, even all around this opioid How about pain? use and delivery. How about yeah, and pain and opioid pain. use. And absolutely. People didn't quantify pain. People thought all the pain in sickle cell was managed in hospitals. Hell no. Yeah, I you know we we just uh, put in the manuscript, and it's very derivative from a lot of stuff you did in this Pisces. And that was when when did you start Pisces? That was nineties. Uh, we we were funded on nine eleven. Nine eleven two thousand one, and uh, for the warriors out there, Pisces was really a unique study at the time, looking at all sorts of. Uh, psychosocial aspects and daily pain journaling and medication use and hospital use and uh, healthcare utilization in a really large group of patients in Virginia. And yeah, I think before that, nobody knew how much pain nobody. people were dealing with at home. They assumed the that, that most pain was treated in hospitals or emergency room. And we flipped the script. We said, nope, only 3% of days are spent in hospitals. Or emergency rooms. Okay, four four percent. But half of the days are spent at home curled up in a knot with, you know, whatever opioids or non-opioid medications you've got. Thirteen percent of those days you're saying you're in a crisis, but you may or may not be in the hospital. And so that really changed people's thought. They went, oh, we thought they were just ER abusers. The iceberg. The iceberg. That's what the iceberg is, is trying to get across. Yeah. 
And I, I think there's still a lot of work to do there. I mean, we're doing studies to try to make changes in sickle cell, but we're still measuring hospital visits. We're still measuring pain admissions. And I, I think we need to get a better handle on what, how it's affecting yeah, life at home and quality of life in general. That's right. We need health services research to take us to the next level so that we can really understand the experience. And I can tell you, uh, even though we did a, you know, zero to 10 scale kind of thing, most people recognize that that is so inferior of a way to measure what really is going on. We need a n dimensional space to really talk about what's going on as, as opposed to a unidimensional line. Yeah. I mean, there's, I don't know, man. I, I mean, you have talked about this a lot. It's um, I don't know. There's just no, it seems like we're so far away from being able to capture the spirit of pain. You know, the, 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 you can capture the biology, but, but how do you capture like the spirit of it? Right. Like how do you capture how it actually ravages somebody's spirit and their ability to, um, socialize and their ability to function. It's um... Here's one way. Here's a health services research method for how to capture that. It's called time trade-off. Have you heard of that? Not in those terms, but explain it to me. How many years of your life would you be willing to give up to be out of pain? Oh, wow. So if I could tell you that I could take your sickle cell away right now, how many years of your life would you say, okay, you can have 10 years of my life. You can have five years of my life. If you could get me out of pain right now, that's one way to begin to quantify how much pain people are in. Cause that, that tells me more than just how much pain I'm in today. That tells me how much pain I'm in in general. Dude, that makes me so sad. The fact that that's like, I mean, I know that wasn't your, <laughs> that wasn't your intention there, but that makes me, that just upsets me because it gives you a sense of, I mean, our patients really suffer, man. Oh, yeah. They, they suffer. And um, if you think about it, choosing hematopoietic stem cell transplantation or gene therapy is a time trade-off. Yeah, absolutely. That is something, man. Whew. All right. Well, that being said, I don't know, as a physician, I don't think I could answer that question about any of my patients. I, I sure as hell don't know how a parent would answer that question. And, and I don't know how a sickle cell patient with their own children would answer that question. I think it gets to experiencing pain, though, because I, I think from the outside, it might be easy to say, well, you know, it's not worth taking years off your life. But if you're in pain, you might trade anything to get rid of that pain. You might That day, you mean? Yeah, that day, and, and if it's every day. And if it's every day. So guess what? A third of patients with sickle cell disease are in pain every day. That's crazy. So I, I, I think you can't make that judgment of how much time you would take unless you're experiencing that, unless you're living it day to day. That would be. Now, that's not true for kids. That's true for adults, though. A third of adults are in pain every day. Uh, I, I wonder about a, a child's ability to appropriately describe what they're feeling. You know, I, I feel like we have a lot of kids who are like low energy. They don't, you know. Who knows what their coping mechanism for pain is. Or, or how they are contextualizing what they feel with no, without knowing what the alternate is. Well, you know, the, the um, International Association for the Study of Pain contextualizes acute and chronic pain as different in that in acute pain, the sympathetic response is there. The emotional baggage of catastrophizing is there. And you're hoping to get out of that state. And so you do things to get out of that state of acute pain. In chronic pain, you've already given up. The emotional expectation that you're going to be out of pain is gone. You have been forced to come up with coping strategies of how to get through the day, and you have dulled yourself down. You either try to distract yourself or dull yourself down so that you don't pay as much attention to the pain, because that's the only way you can get through the day. So there's less of an emotional, there's, there's, a, there's a flat affect that goes with chronic pain. There's obviously depression goes with it, but I think what you're trying to describe, Amar, is that Kids who start to have more pain chronically, they, they have to cope with it somehow. 
And the coping skills sometimes are not that good. So people come up with different mechanisms. We studied, in the Pisces study, we studied, we used something called a coping strategies questionnaire. And we joked because a lot of people prayed to get out, to, to deal with their pain. But a lot of people drank. So we used to joke, you know, how do you deal with chronic pain? God and alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Not mutually exclusive. I mean, that's a coping strategy for a lot of us, man. So I, you know, for the warriors out there, I was reading a great article on this. It was called Psychosocial Determinants of Healthcare Utilization in Sickle Cell Disease Patients by Dr. Fanetta Reese and Dr. Wally Smith. And uh, really talks a lot about health belief model and coping strategies and all, all of these uh, dynamics of, of dealing with pain. We even have extended that whole model to COVID. So we have some exciting new data now on how that model applies even during COVID to everybody. And we studied it in the sickle cell community, in in 600 adults with sickle cell disease at our institution. So we've got data now that says patients with sickle cell disease stay at home, don't come to the emergency department because of the fear of COVID. No surprise, they delay care, even in a crisis, they delay care. No surprise. But everybody sort of suspected that, right? Because the numbers went down, didn't they? And, it, you know, we were seeing a ton of that, and it's, it was awful. I'd have people call me on the phone literally crying in pain and wouldn't come to the emergency room to get help because they were afraid of COVID. Yes. And, and then I had idiots in the hallway tell me, oh, sickle cell pain all stopped during the COVID. And it's like, they just boost their drug addicts. Idiot. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, uh, yeah. That, no, they they were very much in pain. They just were afraid that th- their time trade off. <laughs> yes. I'm not willing to die today wow. in order to be out of pain. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's uh, fair. I mean, I and I got to tell you, man. I every single patient that I've seen, everyone on social media. I mean, this. They believe COVID is real. I see masks on everybody all the time. Nobody's fighting me on that. People are virtually schooling their kids. I mean, it is real. They, they really real. are taking it seriously. Sickle cell, yeah, sickle cell patients, thank God, have not been as affected by COVID as we feared. I believe you all told me that in Michigan, zero mortality right yeah we we as far as we know we haven't had anyone directly affected by covid and we've had quite a few cases but so far yeah zero mortality and our mortality rate is very low you know but the point i'm trying to make is the patients are taking it very seriously they believe that they are more prone to get covid and they believe that they're more likely to die because of their sickle cell disease if they get covid and so they're staying at home all right. So, you know, we're 45 minutes into this thing. And, I, and I, there was a question that I really wanted to ask you because I was having such a tough time with it. I want to hear it from you. What are, looking back now at all the things that you've done, what are, what are the few things that you're most proud of? Sure. As far yeah. as your contributions to sickle cell disease go? Sure. Well, I, I talk about myself as a country doctor. And I got that from some eminent scientist, maybe he got, maybe it was uh, Bob Petersdorf who wrote a textbook on internal medicine or something like that. Or maybe it was uh, Steve, I can't remember Steve's last name, who taught me everything I know about decision analysis in Boston. He said, I'm just a country doctor. And of course, that was tongue in cheek. But I think his point was, you could be very sophisticated in your learning and in your tools and in your, what's in your bag of tricks. But if you think like a country doctor in being humane and applying what you've learned at a level that a patient can understand, your family could understand and you could translate it to them. We always, I teach my mentees, your work isn't done until you can sit at the dining room table and tell your mom what your paper means. I love that. So I'm proud of Pisces and of the iceberg. Everybody understands what an iceberg is. You just say that, 
the iceberg of pain and sickle cell disease. And everybody gets the picture. They have no numbers necessary. It's mostly buried. The part that's sticking up is what the doctors see. They can't see the rest. Oops, the Titanic sinks. And that's a huge contribution because I, I think it was invisible and you made it visible and now it's something people are going to try to address. People are avoiding the icebergs now, right? They're saying, oh yeah, the Titanic's uh, going to sink if we're not careful here. So that I'm proud of that. And I'm proud of all these drugs who are finally coming through now after. I feel like we contributed the base of knowledge such that people could conduct the trials that are being conducted now and get drugs approved. So I'm proud of that. That is amazing. I mean, you, you, there, you have innumerable contributions and you continue to contribute on a daily basis. I'm just happy that I get to talk to you once in a while, man. And I, I should say those are big wholesale contributions. They, you know, change things for all of us. But I, you know, I talked to some experts in fields and you can tell they don't see patients. But when I talk to Wally, I know he's taking care of all of those people in Virginia. And it, it comes through in, in the way you talk about patients. I know you get your hands dirty and, and you are in the clinic. And that's, you know, retail is one by one, but it's so important too. So I, I mean, I think that's a huge accomplishment. That's another a, thing my mentor told me, Bob Centaur and Steve Miller, who were two general internists, both health services researchers, two different cities told me, keep your hands on the plow. Do not give up patient care. It will make you sterile if you give it up. Wow. And so I'm going to, I'm going to say that to all my mentees, keep your hand on the plow. You really need to be able to have that context of what is going on right now that's relevant so that it steers your research. Research that you did 20 years ago sometimes can become relevant during the COVID epidemic. You know, that was a 1997 <laughs> paper that you're quoting that's relevant in now 2020. Wow. So we're in 2020, and granted, 2020 has been kind of a bust, uh, especially after the productive 2019 that sickle cell disease had with two new drugs in the span of. 10 days of each other. What, what, what do we have to look forward to, man? What, what is, what is Wally Smith got up his sleeve that's come in that, that warriors around here listening to this should be excited about, should be keeping an eye out for? Well, it's funny. You talked about legacy. That's where I'm at now. And my job now is to turn this over to the next generation. When my dad died, he was the last of his generation, his siblings, Nine of them, he was the last one. That meant that my cousins and I, all of his siblings, kids, and me and my brother, we are now, I use the word it. We're it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's our job to, you know, to, to pass, pass along to the next generation our enthusiasm not let them forget our history, help them maintain our passion, stay as close to the plow as we stayed, but bring the new technologies. So you gotta believe that social media is gonna figure prominently in everything we do from here on out. You gotta believe that. I'm talking about doctors. I'm not talking about patients. I, I think it's going to change the way doc. We already it already has. Telemedicine is on us. It's never going away. Things are going to be possible with telemedicine that were not possible before. And big data plus telemedicine will probably revolutionize medical care in general. And therefore, the next generation has got to figure out what a healthcare system. I'm a health service researcher still. What is the healthcare system? for sickle cell disease need to look like now? I think that's a real question. And I think there's some research questions around that. How many clinic visits do you really need to have? What about infusion centers as the main place of care? And we stop doing hospitalizations if we can for all but the, you know, the few. And what about home monitoring, 
home infusion. I wrote a draft of a study called Homesick. Get it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> H-O-M-E-S-I-C. That's a great acronym, man. <laughs> Homesick. What would that look like? You get the van, it pulls up. The nurse gets out. The doc gets out. Start the IV. You leave the uh, nurse, nurse practitioner with the patient. You move on to the next house. You're doing home. You're doing home business all over again. Remember Marcus Welby? Good God, this would be Marcus Welby, except you got your laptop with you. You're plugged into the database. Anything you need to know, you can get it. You draw the blood. The van takes the blood back to the hospital at the end of the day. I mean, I think that's doable. Really, a country doctor. Yeah, I mean. Those are those are powerful words, Doctor Smith. And um, you know, I, I hope that I hope you're right, man. I hope that we are able to continue on with passion and vigor. And I, I, I part of me is is worried that we have this really short window that people are attentive and care about sickle cell disease. And I'm worried that that window is going to close, and then we're just going to you know, if we don't if we don't seize the opportunity we have right now, we're we're going to miss out on on solidifying some type of structure to provide health services to this population. And I don't know if that's like a pessimistic view, but that's just how I feel. I feel like this, uh, the limelight, the spotlight is not going to last forever. Uh, I'm a little more optimistic because I'm sitting on a podcast with two guys who are holding the window open, shouting at people. So (laughs) I I appreciate you guys. And I'm optimistic because you're worried. Fair enough. I'm glad my worry is paying off for somebody. <laughs> I'm optimistic because you're doing TED Talks. I'm optimistic because you're it. Sorry, you're it. <laughs> I'm going to tag you back on that one. <laughs> I mean, you, you, have, you, have, uh, you have lots more to contribute, my friend. And we look forward to you chairing the FSCDR um, annual meeting that's coming up September 23rd to 25th. That looks like a great meeting. It is power packed. Do not miss this meeting. Anything and everything you might want to know about news and sickle cell care and sickle cell research, it's going to be in this meeting. And it's, it's virtual now? It's all virtual. And uh, warriors can sign up and log Absolutely on and listen to all the segments? Absolutely can. It's not free. But it's cheap. And it goes to a good cause. They're putting together a journal. They're putting on a meeting. There's a lot of advocacy. I like good stuff. And we're patient-friendly. There are going to be patient panels. There's going to be uh, a lot of uh, patient-friendly material. And that, and that is not to throw shade on SCDAA, who I love and I work with. So, Of course. Of course. Well, Dr. Smith, I want to be cognizant of your time, my friend. You have spent... Um, almost an hour with us now dropping more bombs of knowledge and invigorating us. And we appreciate you for it. I do. I do have to ask you this. I I want you to play another game of tag. I want you to tell me who the next guest on this podcast needs to be so that I can say Wally Smith tagged you on his way out. Admiral Gerard. Wow. All right. It's it's like you're in our playbook. We have to make that happen. I wonder how to make that happen. I wonder how we can do that. He's a man of passion. I, I saw him at the White House today. Can I ask you guys, when's the last time this ever happened? When, when did this ever, when was the last time, Wally, that you remember this ever happening? A group of sickle cell patients with a sickle cell doctor sitting with the first lady talking about sickle cell disease. Has that ever happened? Right. I don't think that's ever happened. That's amazing. I mean, that's, that's amazing to me. That, that... But that's Admiral Gerard's influence. Exactly. For sure. He means it. It's visible. It's just visible. Because he means it, I think he'll give you an hour. And I I think it would be a power-packed hour. And I think that it would say to the Warriors, okay, we we really count. Amazing. Well, there you go. Admiral Jar, come on the podcast. (laughs) All right, Dr. Mike, anything else you got here for for Dr. Smith before we let him go? Uh, That was great. Thanks for coming on. Um, look forward to seeing you in person whenever this COVID is all over, but, uh, always great to talk to you. It was great. You know, I love you guys both. You know that. Yeah. We love you too, man. Thank you so much again. Be well, be safe. And we'll see you on September 23rd to 25th. Sounds good. All right, my friend. 
Take care. All right, Dr. Z, that was a great episode. You know, this is one of my favorite things about this podcast is getting the opportunity to talk to a legend like Wally Smith and really learn from him. I'm always left feeling inspired anytime I talk to him. There's so few people like that, that just a conversation with them can re-energize you and reaffirm that, you know, you're doing a good thing by taking care of sickle cell patients. And I'm sure the Warriors got that in that episode. Well, I I hope the Warriors enjoyed that. And uh, even though there wasn't a word of the day, even though we didn't cover one specific piece of the literature, I think I think there was a lot to learn. So, so you guys make sure you um, share this episode with, with anybody you think could learn more about sickle cell disease. And in this case, sickle cell related pain. Continue to live well with sickle cell. Follow me at Dr. Z Sickle Cell. And me at Imagineer. And that's all we've got for you this week. Stay tuned. Keep living well with sickle cell. Peace.